Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, our first legislative uh, update webinar for the new year. Uh, thank you all for taking the next 50 minutes or so of your of your day uh, to um, learn about what's happening in, in, in Harrisburg. Um, I'm going to go kind of quickly because we have a lot of material. Um, so um, let's just get right into it. First of all, welcome to budget season in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have a new budget, uh, at least a new proposed budget, which sort of kicks off the official uh, uh, beginning of the legislative year. Uh, we're also at the beginning of new legislative session. Um, as you may know, Pennsylvania's two-year legislative session is one of the longest in the, in the country. Um, so it started January 1 of 2019 and runs until November 30th of 2020. So very, very uh, long uh, legislative session. Uh, a lot of new faces in Harrisburg. Going to touch upon this a little bit. Uh, one of the largest uh, incoming freshman classes that I can recall, maybe maybe the only one that uh, may have been larger, is the uh, the pay rate pay, pay rate class pay raise class of a few years ago. Um, Tom Wolf is back in his second term. Uh, this time he has a new lieutenant governor, John Fetterman, who is sort of uh, staking out his own ground and his own own issues. Uh, Governor Wolf and uh, Lieutenant Governor Governor, uh, Governor Fetterman seem to be uh, more of a uh, of a team than uh, than uh, Wolf and the, the Mike Stack, his previous Lieutenant Governor. Good news for the governor is that he has more Democrats in both the state House and the state Senate. Um, while that while he has more more uh, Democrats, strangely enough, the both of those chambers probably veered a little bit further to the right and more conservative after the election. So um, a lot a lot happening. Um, and now, of course, uh, we have a proposed 2019 budget from, from, from Governor Wolf. We're going to take a, a dive into, into some of these issues. Um, and of course, uh, if you have any questions at the end, uh, feel free to, to uh, post them. If I don't get to your questions, we'll certainly follow up with you after the webinar. So here's our agenda today. We want to talk about, obviously, the, the budget. And, and keep in mind, I'll, I'll reference this uh, throughout, the, throughout the, the, the program, though. This is a proposed budget. It's a starting point. Obviously, the General Assembly is going to have its say, um, but this is a starting point. What's new at the state capitol? As I just mentioned, a lot of new faces, um, a lot of shuffling of, of chairs. Um, with the beginning of a new session, it's also slow uh, in getting started. Um, some bills have been introduced, but not an overwhelming number. Um, and legislative update, talk about some of the issues that are already out there. Um, again, not a lot. Talk to you about what we're working on, PICPA, uh, Department of Revenue voice, and then a plug for the PAC. All right, let's talk about the governor's 20, um, 2019 uh, 2020-2020 fiscal year proposed budget. Just an overview. He's looking to spend uh, in the area of $34.146 billion, which is about $972, uh, $927 million more, 2.8% uh, over last year's budget. Last year's budget is around $33.2 billion. Um, it was approved by the governor, uh, by the General Assembly, and signed into law. This is uh, Wolf's fifth budget, uh, and this budget continues his investment uh, in public education, cornerstone for the last four years, nothing changing here. Um, a, re, um, a, a refocus, if you will, or, or, or repurposing of, of workforce development is another um, for cornerstone of, of this year's budget. Um, also, a uh, looking to increase opportunities for the state agri agriculture industry um, and supporting our, our most needy through uh, in, the, in the Commonwealth through um, increased funding for uh, disorder treatments, intellectual disabilities, and also uh, also the opioid crisis. Crisis. This budget, the 1920 budget, also proposes uh, transferring. About 185 million from uh, existing funds to to other uh, other categories to fund those programs. So there's a little bit there's a lot happening in this budget. Uh, it is a complex budget, while not as, not as controversial as is past year budget is. It is there are a lot of moving parts. Governor's also proposing uh, supplemental appro supplemental appropriation for the current fiscal year, the 1819, and that's about uh, another a request for another 495 million for the current fiscal year. 
I think what was most surprising with this budget um, was the lack of rancor after the uh, after the governor's budget address on February 5th. Uh, both the House and Senate Republican leadership teams held a joint press conference, which is a bit unusual, but most of them were praising the budget as a as a very uh, good starting point for negotiations. And again, that back to that, it's a starting point. Uh, but it was uh, rather refreshing to hear um, praise rather than, you know, um, negative comments toward the budget. I think the only, and I wouldn't even uh, characterize it as negative, is uh, cautionary with Senator Pat Brown, the uh, appropriations chairman in the Senate, who basically said, you know, we just need to make sure um, that we do not continue to overspend, um, over, uh, overspend um, for, for during the, the fiscal year. So um, that was the, really the only, the only cautionary note. Um, uh, and again, this is a, a starting point. Uh, the overall operating budget for the Commonwealth is $85.8 billion. That's down uh, by about $734 million, 1.3% over last year's budget. Um, one of the big uh, contributors to that is a drop in the federal funds, uh, fu federal funds um, allocated in its budget by about $798 million, so 2.6% drop in that federal funds uh, component. General fund revenues, you can see PIT and sales and use tax, again, bringing in a, a lion's share of revenues uh, coming into the Commonwealth. Corporate net uh, income at 9.7% has been holding pretty steady over the last several years. Other taxes are inheritance, realty, and, and, and what have you. Uh, looking at expenditures, again, at $34.1 billion, uh, pre-K education uh, and what I'll call health and human services, again, are the lion's share of, of uh, uh, the the, the, spend, the expenditures for in the in just the general fund component of the budget. Let's take a quick look at a, a financial statement um, for the uh, for the state, uh, looking at uh, comparing eighteen nine comparing the last three uh, fiscal years. Just a couple of um, just a couple of points I'd like to uh, make here. One with regard to the official budget revenue estimates, you can see. Um, that line item from 34.39 million in this fiscal year to 35.269 million. Um, that's a that's a uh, an increase of around 2.6 percent is what the administration is projecting. General fund tax revenues, however, general fund tax revenues are uh, expected to increase by about 3.3 percent. Um, and that's also that's good news, obviously. Also good news, and the governor's office is projecting. Uh, solid growth in the, the big three uh, revenue raisers for the for the state, and those are the corporate net income tax, the uh, sales and use tax, and also uh, the personal income tax. The CNI is anticipated to increase by 2.4 percent, sales and use tax by 3.1 percent, and the personal income tax PIT by 4.2 percent. Also, you can see that there's a continued uh, closer to the bottom of the chart uh, of the statement. Uh, transfers into the rainy day fund. Governor's continuing to propose increased transfers into uh, the state's rainy day fund. Here are our collections through the first half of the 18-19 fiscal year. Um, the only thing that really jumps out at this is the the uh, decrease, um, the difference in the PIT withholding and non-withholding. Non-withholding is, is, is majority is predominantly from uh, estimated payments. There's a couple of factors we believe that are that are. Um, weighing in on this, one is the stock market, um, uh, the, the downward slide in the stock market late last year, and taxpayers are basically not doing their fourth quarter payments and, and uh, rolling those over into, we, we anticipate, we expect, uh, rolling those into, into April payments. So the good news is that the Commonwealth uh, revenues are coming in. It looks like there will be a, a very nice uh, um, uh, surplus for the, for the fiscal year. Now let's move on to, to specifics. Uh, so Governor uh, Wolf, as we know, the last four years has made public education funding his number one priority. It's it's his cornerstone, and that doesn't change with this budget. He's proposing uh, again a, a net a net increase um, or an increase in basic education funding by two hundred million dollars. Um, that's that that that's not the whole story in that basic uh, basic education funding. Uh, component. Let me try to unwrap a little bit of that. So 
the, the actual overall increase is more in the line of $442 million. Again, for, just for that basic education, that's a 7.25% increase. That's a, a pretty significant increase. But what, what the governor is proposing, he's proposing rolling about $260 million from the Ready to Learn block grant program. So to another $260 million. There's about $268 million last year in the current fiscal year in that line item. The governor is proposing to roll that into the basic education funding. So that's why that increase. The remaining $8 million, $7, $8 million in the Ready to Learn block grant uh, will will remain for chartered schools. Basic, basic education funding line item uh, is now six point five billion dollars, and that's the the largest single line item in the in the in the state's thirty four billion dollar budget. Of that two hundred million that I have listed there, that two hundred uh, million of, of of new monies, if you will, um, three thirteen point eight, almost fourteen million, will go to about eighty school districts throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, to help them pay for a new mandate in this budget. And that mandate is to increase teacher starting salary. The, the current statutory th threshold is $18,000 a year. The governor is proposing uh, to fund that, uh, to increase that level to $45,000 a year. Uh, and the governor is is going to, the, the Commonwealth is going to pay for that increase. So they're setting aside about $14 million. Again, 80, 80 or so school districts, mostly rural, but 80 or so school districts are impacted by that. Another $2, two million of that $200 million will, will go to distressed uh, distressed school districts. And I think there's specifically two school districts that, that, that will get that uh, allocation. Basic education funding over Wolf's four years, in, in, first four years in office have increased by about $633 million or 11%. Some other some other items, uh, 50 million for special education funding. That's a 4.4 inc percent increase over last year. Uh, and that over the first four years of his administration, the governor has increased that line item by 90 million dollars, or 8.6 percent. Um, 50 million dollars for pre-K counts and Head Start. That breaks down into 40 million for pre-K counts and 10 million into the Head Start program. Eight million uh, for a new stay in Pennsylvania program. That's for community college graduates. One-time uh, grants of $2,500 if they graduate from a Commonwealth uh, community college and stay in, in Pennsylvania. Modernizing the compulsory school and dropout ages. I didn't know this until uh, last week, but um, the compulsory uh, age to go to school in Pennsylvania is eight years old. The governor wants to lower that to six years, six years of age. And the dropout rate, which is 17, uh, the governor wants to propose it to uh, to 18. Additional training opportunities funding there. Um, Seven million dollar increase for the Pashi schools, and those are uh, state-owned schools. Ship, um, uh, Kutztown, um, Slippery Rock. There are 14 of them. Uh, 45 of uh, college. Pitt, Penn State, uh, Pitt, Penn State, Lincoln, and Temple University are all flat funded, as are community colleges. Um, there's also 45 million uh, allocated for school safety and security funding, uh, and no, no uh, general fund appropriations for the Pennsylvania School Construction and Reimbursement Program, the the, the Plan Con. Uh, the only funding is for um, in the in this year's budget is for uh, debt obligation. Next chart, you can see um, the uh, over the over the course of the last uh, nearly 10 years or so, funding for pre-K through to 12 education. You can see the significant of uh, the substantial increase over the last uh, four plus years. So, workforce development. Uh, this is a, um, a not a, I don't want to say a new initiative, but there's a renewed tr strategic focus uh, from the governor on uh, workforce development programs. Um, he's introducing the statewide workforce education and accountability program, SWEEP for short. Um, and SWEEP is essentially a, um, using the governor's, the administration's terms, it's kind of a holistic approach to workforce development uh, initiatives uh, across the, uh, the the enterprise of the Commonwealth um, and from birth really to, to retirement. Um, and it's helping the, the uh, Goal is to help kind of mesh those uh, programs, um, workforce needs um, through uh, together throughout the um, throughout again throughout the Commonwealth, uh, coordinating education, workforce development, and human services need. 
Below that, below the SWEEP program, the governor is proposing to create the Keystone Economic Development and Workforce Command Center. Um, this will be uh, executed through uh, an executive order, and it will bring together not only the uh, different state agencies, but also outside stakeholders to, again, coordinate how these workforce development programs should operate, where funding should go, and, and sort of act as a, uh, really a, a, a command for um, for the, these various programs. Uh, the governor has announced that Gene Barr, president of the Pennsylvania Chamber, and Rick Bloomingdale, president of AFL-CIO, will, will be co-chairs of that program. Governor is also looking to increase funding by, uh, or allocate 15 million for infants and toddlers on waiting lists uh, for um, childcare. Uh, there, this would uh, move uh, 900 or so um, infants and toddlers off a of, off of waiting list. Also $10 million for incentive uh, for, for increased fees for, um, uh, for, for child care as well. $5 million for pa Parents Pathway. This is a, a model program, uh, five, or five to seven uh, programs that will coordinate uh, uh, education and, and uh, post-secondary education for parents who are looking to, looking to get a, a, a degree or a post-secondary degree, help with uh, social services and break down barriers to, to employment. Um, and $5 million for uh, expanding home care uh, visits, uh, which will help an additional 800, uh, 800 or so families uh, in need. So again, workforce development, you're gonna hear a lot of talk about that over the course of the next several weeks and months uh, in a renewed strategic focus on trying to get uh, the programs moving in unison in, 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 the, in the same direction and trying to really break down barriers and obstacles that, uh, that, that work against these programs. Agriculture industry, one of our largest industries in the, in the Commonwealth, um, governor is proposing a, a new farm bill that will be a comprehensive package of funding opportunities and resources um, be made to help help the industry. A um, couple of, of key programs here that the governor is proposing: two million dollars to establish uh, the Pennsylvania Agriculture Business and Development Center, uh, and again, this will be res a resource for farmers to create business. Uh, businesses to transition and to uh, create succession planning. Uh, this will fold the Center for Farm Transition and, uh, and the uh, Preserve Farm Resource Center into the PA Ag Agriculture Business Development Center. Expanding the Resource uh, Enhancement and Protection Program by $3 million. We will take that uh, tax credit program from $10 million uh, to $13 million. Uh, 2.6 million uh, towards bolstering the state's uh, organic industry, um, and also $5 million for uh, rebuilding or expanding agriculture in infrastructure uh, after a disaster. Uh, protecting the most vulnerable under the uh, umbrella of the Department of, of, of Human Services. Department of Human Services is projected to receive a, um, a 400 uh, and six million dollar increase of 3.23 uh, percent uh, over last year, and that now is uh, that uh, department is now, I believe, the uh, the large it continues to be the largest uh, single department in the Commonwealth at 2.12.9 uh, billion dollars. Um, again, 15 million dollars to serve an additional 765 individuals with intellectual disabilities and autism, moving them off, uh, uh, moving them uh, into. Uh, uh, different living, living situations, includes funding for individuals uh, transitioning out of special education programs, um, 6.8 million to provide a 3% increase uh, to infant and toddler early intervention programs, 1.5 million uh, for naloxone uh, for the continued fight on the, the uh, opioid epidemic. And uh, the final uh, phase in of the, of the administration's community health choice program uh, that's a uh, mandatory uh, managed care program for uh, elderly and, and individuals with physical disabilities. Other provisions in the budget um, proposes to provide uh, funding for local state police coverage of municipalities who don't have uh, their own police force. Um, a couple of other provisions there just call your attention to. Uh, 15 million to assist counties for paying for updated voter uh, voting machines. 
Also, um, increase in the minimum wage. The governor is proposing increase uh, in the minimum wage uh, to $12 an hour by January, July 1 of this year and a 50 cent increase uh, thereafter until it gets to $15 an hour by 2025. Um, the governor argues that, um, that, that this is a benefit for a number of ways. One, uh, obviously paying sustaining uh, family sustaining wages, but two, uh, it will increase the depart, uh, uh, revenues uh, to tax revenues uh, to the tune of 120 million through increased PIT and sales and use tax. And then it would also save the Commonwealth um, uh, 34 million or so in, in, in uh, additional services that uh, Commonwealth would not have to provide. Uh, continued, as I mentioned, continued uh, deposits into the Pennsylvania Rainy Day Fund um, to ho hopefully get to the 278 million level by 2024, which would be close to the end of the uh, Wolf uh, second term. Pension funding, again, uh, the administration for the fourth, fourth year is making the full annual required contribution to um, PSERS, which is the Public School Employees Retirement System. And that is um, an additional $160 million uh, this year. That's a 6.5% increase. That line item now, um, that line item now is $2.648 billion. Um, and he's also proposing for SERS, the State Employees Retirement System, that's the, uh, the state employee system, uh, an increase, that's, this is the third year they're, they're meeting, the governor's paying, the administration's paying the annual ARC, annual re required contribution. Um, that's totaling about $668 million, which is $18 million or 1.3% over, over last year's uh, allocation for um, the, the SERS budget. Um, I mentioned, I forgot to mention, but uh, one of the, one of the provisions, one of the, uh, I guess, kind of surprises, um, that governor made with this um, budget is uh, no taxes, no broadway tax increases. Although um, he is proposing once again combined reporting, and I don't think this is a, I don't think this is a, a shock to anybody. But proposing combined reporting, um, combining combined reporting, uh, which is um, found in 25 or 26 other states, and just a, a different method for apportioning uh, income uh, for its corporate net income tax purposes. Um, effective January 1 of 2020 uh, with a corresponding decrease in the CNI rate. Um, obviously, everyone wants to see the CNI rate decrease go down, um, but the question is, how do you fund it? Governor has tied it to combined reporting. Um, not sure this is, I think this is gaining more traction than it has historically, uh, but it still has a long way to get serious consideration, I think. But I can tell you that you're starting to hear rumblings about maybe we should take, and, rumblings from you know, Republicans that maybe we should take a look at this combined reporting. Um, just an FYI, a 1% um, increase uh, or decrease, 1% uh, uh, CNI rate brings in about $340 million, I believe is what I, I, I heard, read somewhere. Also, um, this is not part of the budget. It was part of Act uh, 43 of 2017, uh, but the, um, the, the net operating loss uh, percentage is set to increase this year to 40% uh, of taxable income. So that's already part of uh, part of uh, the, the tax code. Um, not part of the governor's budget, but wanted to talk about a little bit. It's kind of out of the budget framework, but it's not totally out of the budget framework. And this is his restore uh, PA proposal. And this is to um, monetize uh, a severance tax to fund infrastructure uh, and invest in infrastructure programs uh, through the, uh, throughout the Commonwealth. And here you can see some of the um, uh, some of the areas that the governor has uh, has targeted for for funding. And he's looking for a 4.5 billion dollar uh, uh, investment in in these areas. Um, the impact fee would stay. Um, so in addition to the impact fee, uh, these um, uh, drillers, uh, Marcellus Shell drillers, would. Would have to also pay um, or or the monetize or pay a severance tax. What um, that's kind of the a very I know high level high overview of of the thirty four point one billion dollar spending program. Again, there's a lot of other details, a lot of moving parts to this. You know, transfers from different uh, programs to other programs to fund and 
um, a lot of complexity to the budget. But one thing that we didn't hear uh, in this year's budget, which I think uh, what we were kind of surprised about is, is um, there was no call for tax reform. We thought the governor uh, may urge the General Assembly to take a more uh, aggressive look at tax reform since the federal government did tax reform, Congress did tax reform a couple of, a year and a half or so ago or a year ago, why, you know, maybe now is the time to look at Pennsylvania. So we were a little bit surprised at that. Um, although I, I don't think that is completely off the table. Um, House, new House Majority Leader Brian Cutler um, talked about, uh, during his post-budget comments, talked about, you know, taking a look at uh, uh, tax business tax reform in Pennsylvania. So it's not completely off the table. Um, PIC, PICPA uh, and members of our Fiscal Responsibility Task Force and our State Tax Committee are actually meeting tomorrow to kind of talk about uh, some of the issues. Uh, um, if, if we had a wish list, what were some of what would be some of those issues that we would put forth to the General Assembly to have them uh, take a look at? So where are we now? Uh, well, we're in budget hearings. So the next two to three weeks, both the House and Senate Appropriations Committees uh, will have, um, will bring in the different the department secretaries and cabinet officials and work, work walk through the, the, the different components of the budget. The House uh, Appropriations Committee started off this week. Uh, on Monday, they had the Independent Fiscal Office and also the Department of Revenue. And this is an opportunity for members of the committee to ask questions. So there were a lot of questions uh, for both IFO and the Department of Revenue about the minimum wage increase and what would it mean. There was also a lot of questions about combined reporting, um, questions about property tax and rent rebate. But I'd have to say the minimum wage and combined reporting were, were probably two of the most uh, uh, asked question topics um, for the uh, for the Department of Revenue and IFO. So you, there you can see um, budget hearings continue today in the Appropriations Committee. Uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee um, begins next week, again, with revenue and uh, the Independent Fiscal Office. And again, the goal is to have a budget uh, by the July 1st deadline. Um, I think there are a lot of positives moving in that direction. One, um, the fact that the governor's budget proposal was pretty well received. Um, so um, there's not, again, that, that, that hot button issue, even with um, you know, the minimum wage increase, and which, which is a hot button issue for some Republicans, um, combined reporting, um, it, you know, there doesn't seem to be that, um, that, that, that issue that has Republicans really um, upset about or ready to, you know, put up a, a long struggle for this year's budget. The other factor is um, uh, re general fund revenues are pretty are, are positive throughout the, the year. Uh, year to date, uh, I think the, the slide showed a $200 million, sur $290 million surplus, and that's anticipated to, to grow, uh, uh, continue to grow, uh, not significantly, but but should grow. Um, both IFO and, uh, and the, uh, the administration are believe it will, will will grow over the course of the next uh, six months or so. So a lot of positives to um, to a, a, a meeting that, that July 1 date. I'm not saying that it will happen, uh, but there are a lot of positives uh, pointing to that direction. So moving on, let's talk about the, the, the legislature. As I said in the opening, uh, a lot happening and a lot happening in the, fat, in the, in, in the context of a lot of new faces. Um, in both the House and Senate. And that requires a lot of adjustment, not only for um, the caucuses, uh, the, 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 the returning members, but also for, for us, those outside stakeholders, um, you know, trying to get uh, face time with new legislators to introduce. And not all legislators know who the PICPA is. And, you know, that's our job to sort of um, educate them. So there you can see the, the calendar, the proposed cal tentative calendar for the first part of uh, the 19, uh, 2019, um, kind of surprised. Typically, uh, the end of June goes into the 29th and 30th. But I think it's safe to say that um, you know, the General Assembly will be in throughout the, uh, the month of June. New faces. Um, so in the House, and I've, I've, this may be a little bit repetitive for some of you, but 43 new members in this Pennsylvania State House of Representatives. Again, a pretty 
significant number. Of those, um, of those 43, uh, 24 Republican and 19, uh, back up, uh, 24 are Democrats, Democratic, and uh, 19 are Republicans, um, and 18 of those are women. This uh, 50, um, there are now 50 women of the 203 members of the State House, which is the largest number ever. Uh, those numbers um, have changed significantly from, if you, you see 110 Republicans to 91 Democrats. That's a big, big shift from uh, last session when it was 121 Republicans uh, to 82 Democrats. So the Democrats made significant gains at, uh, in the November 2018 election. There are already two vacancies um, that will be filled in, in special elections. Uh, again, as I said at the outset, while Democrats uh, made gains in the House, and as we'll see in the Senate, um, Republicans, uh, that, with that 110 Republican majority is probably more, uh, more, con more conservative than it was um, beginning, of 2000, beginning of last session. Pennsylvania Senate, same, same, uh, uh, same drill here. Uh, Republicans had a 34 to uh, 34 to 16 uh, margin. That is down to now 26, 21. Pretty significant. There are five, actually seven new members of the state senate. Seven new members: five Democrats and two Republicans. Of those seven, five are women. Um, there are now 12 women um, in the uh, 50 member that comprise 12 women that, uh, in the, the 50 member state senate. Again, that's the largest number ever as well. Um, there are three currently three vacancies. Um, Senator, uh, former Senator Guy Reschenthaler resigned his seat in January to take his seat in Congress, and just recently Senator Rich Alloway uh, from uh, the Franklin County area, Chambersburg area, uh, announced that he would resign at the end of this month in February. And Don White, uh, uh, US, uh, state senator from. Uh, Indiana County also announced that he would resign at the end of uh, at the end of uh, February. So three three special elections. Uh, the Reschenthaler seat in Allegheny County is the um, is clearly the more competitive of of the races. Um, Democrats Senate Democrats have fielded a very strong candidate, um, and they feel very optimistic that um, that they can be competitive and, and win that seat, which would narrow it down to 26 to uh, 22. Um, the other two seats are I don't want to say solid Republican, but they 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 trend uh, they trend uh, Republican. Take a real quick look at our CPA legislators. We're we're happy to welcome a new new member to the what I call the CPA caucus. Uh, of course, Pat Brown is the senior member, the only member in the Senate, but the senior member, uh, chair of appropriation. As you can see, he's also chair of uh, or a member of the Senate Finance Committee. Mike Pfeiffer, um, the uh, senior member of the delegation in the House, is the new chairman of the House Finance Committee. Um, Mike is a CPA. Uh, background is a CPA. Uh, he is inactive now, but um, he brings uh, a, uh, a knowledge, uh, an understanding of the issues to the, to the, the chairman spot that we have not had in, in many years. So he's a welcome. We, we hope he will stay there for, for, for many years to come. Uh, Representative George Dunbar from the Westmoreland County area, also a background as a, as a CPA, both public accounting and, and, uh, and industry. Uh, is on a, a number of, but inactive at this point, a number of uh, key committees, particularly the Finance Committee. Two more, uh, three more uh, CPAs, Keith Greiner, uh, active CPA, Finance Committee, as you can see his other committees, Frank Ryan, uh, also active member of the House Finance Committee, and our newest member, uh, Representative ben, Chancha, ben Sanchez, and our, our first uh, Democratic member of the caucus uh, since Greg Fight. many many, many years ago, at least 20, 20 years ago. Um, Representative Sanchez uh, was with Arthur Anderson, got his law degree from Temple. Um, he's also not actively licensed, but um, has obviously has the knowledge of, of issues. So unfortunately, not on, a, on finance. He is on appropriations, not on finance, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll get around to getting him on finance. Welcome, welcome addition to this, to this group. Key leadership uh, offices, um, not much here. The only real um, new information, are they, these are our, our four key committees that we really you know, focus on at the PICPA and the government relations team. 
Uh, obviously, um, House Finance, Mike Pfeiffer being the new chairman, um, uh, is that's the news there. Jake Wheatley is returning as a Democrat, his Democratic counterpart. In the Professional Licensure Committee, and this is where the any changes to the CPA uh, licensing law go through. Dave Hickernell is the new chairman of, of that, Republican chairman of that. Harry Reedshaw has, has been the Democratic chairman for a number of years, so no, no changes there. Um, the other committees that we follow are education and judiciary, particularly the Judiciary Committee with liability issues. Um, and that has that has completely changed uh, in leadership. Senator Lisa Baker of uh, Luzerne County is the chairman of that committee, and she replaces Stu Greenleaf, who was chairman of that committee. Um, chairman of that committee when I started uh, in the state Senate uh, in 1986. So the first change in that leadership spot in 30, 30 years. Uh, new Democratic chairman, uh, that's in flux right now. I'm not sure who that, the, the, Dalen Leach has resigned his post for the time being. And Rob Kaufman uh, from Franklin County and Tim Briggs from Montgomery County are the new Republican and Democratic, respectively, uh, chairs of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, moving on to our legislative agenda, uh, a couple of issues that we're working on. One is a fix to um, the 1099 miscellaneous withholding requirement that was part of Act 43 of 2017. Uh, Representative Keith Greiner had a bill last session that um, we were able to get out of the House Finance Committee, not out of the House Senate, not out of the complete House, but out of the House Finance Committee with, uh, uh, with I think it was unanimous support in that committee. Uh, really trying to uh, focus on two issues. One is the creeping $5,000 threshold. Uh, that is, when do you when do you start collecting? Particularly in the, in the scenario where um, you're not near that threshold, and maybe the last half of, two, of the year you make uh, a large payment to a contractor that pierces that $5,000 threshold. Let's say they you know $5,000 and you know $6,000. Where do you do you start collecting from 5001 to six or the Department of Revenue's position is you have to go back and collect from dollar one. That's not what we believe the intent of the legislation is. Um, and the um, reason we're using Representative Greiner is because he was one of the one of the members who uh, uh, drafted the, the initial uh, rather quickly, uh, unfortunately, but quickly drafted the 1099 provision in Act 43. Um, and his his view is that that's not what the, the General Assembly contemplated when uh, when we when they enacted uh, that provision. So working on that, also providing trying to clarify protection for payer, payers and leases uh, from assessment of the tax. Um, so we where do we stand? Uh, the legislation uh, we hope will be introduced. Uh, we'll have a new bill number to it. Hopefully, will be introduced. Um, and we're still working with the department uh, and still working with other stakeholders who have an interest in this. But this is an issue that uh, we uh, believe strongly that needs to be uh, further clarified by the General Assembly. Income tax reporting for estates and revocable trust. Again, this uh, Representative Greiner. Uh, this was a um, a bill sponsored by Representative Michael Kaur from last year, uh, which made it out of the House and I think it was House Bill 2303, made it out of the House Support Finance Committee and out of the full House unanimously, but died in the Senate because of lack of uh, lack of uh, time um, to get it through the Senate. Now, Representative Keith Greiner has, has introduced this bill and it would simply permit an executor or administrator uh, uh, decedent's estate to elect to file a combined annual return. Uh, this is similar to a provision in the uh, in a federal provision. So we're just trying to mirror that provision. Uh, Representative Greiner, again, will will be introducing that bill for us um, uh, shortly. We hope by the, we hope by the end of uh, this month. Retirement Task Force. This is uh, Rep State Treasurer Joe Torcella's uh, task force. Bob Jaswinski, uh, PICPA past uh, president, was a, a PICPA past president, was a member of the task force. And this is really looking at um, finding a niche uh, for uh, workers who are employed um, maybe through small employers who do not provide um, a retirement uh, uh, a retirement uh, system, and this is trying to create a, a, a niche um, with a, uh, to trying to create a program to uh, to address that uh, that area. Um, other states have moved forward with this. Um, 
the, the, the task force uh, will be issuing a report um, shortly, and then we'll, uh, we'll likely see re uh, legislation come from that. Uh, one issue that's not on here that I'd like to uh, bring to your attention, um, it's not one of our normal issues, it's not a, a, you know, a normal PICPA issue, but it's a, um, it's a legal, it's a liability, it's a tort reform issue. Civil justice reform issues is the, the new terminology that we like to use. But um, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is proposing a change to uh, its venue rules and medical, that it deals with medical, uh, me medical uh, cases. Um, in the early 2000s, there was a real crisis in the, the medical community. Um, doctors were um, not able to get liability insurance. Hospitals were closing. I'm, I'm sure those of you who, who uh, were working at that time remember that, uh, that, that crisis. Um, the, the courts, uh, through a, um, uh, a, a committee of the General Assembly, uh, outside stakeholders in the court, came up with some proposed changes to the rules of civil procedure. And one of that is venue shopping. Um, the, the courts uh, uh, limited um, where you could bring a case in a medical, this is only limited to medical malpractice, uh, where you could bring cases. What was happening before is cases were, were being driven into the Philadelphia court system, which is not uh, a great court system for um, uh, to be in. And so the court now is proposing to change those ven that, that rule to go back to the way the rules were prior to the early 2000 change in venue. Bring this to your attention. Uh, PICPA is actively engaged in this issue through our uh, work with the Pennsylvania Coalition for Civil Justice Reform. Uh, it's just a potentially a, a major, major issue for um, individuals, access to care, individuals and businesses. So it's an issue that uh, just wanted to bring to your attention. Real quickly, as I said, not a lot of bills have been introduced at this point where, again, that there's a slow stream of, of legislation being introduced um, early, early part of uh, this session. I uh, wanted to just point out a couple of bills that, are, that we're monitoring. House Bill 17, sponsored by Representative Frank Ryan, would put a 10-year uh, statutory, uh, a 10-year limit on the Department of Revenue's ability to collect and assess taxes. Uh, on individuals. This is limited to, to PIT only. Um, our, our PICPA State Tax Committee um, is taking a look at this as well, and we're, we're, uh, we're, we're looking at making some additional changes in, in that area. Uh, Representative Tommy Sankey has introduced House Bill 19, um, and this clarifies that fees paid by financial institutions um, for canned uh, Custom can software, security equipment, and services services uh, fees uh, related to those those issues are not subject to the state uh, sales and use tax. There's a discrepancy with the Department of Revenue. Um, Representative Sankey is trying to clarify that. Uh, Representative Pam Snyder has introduced House Bill 25, uh, and, and it provides that a taxpayer who um, the taxpayers who are delinquent on a tax liability. Uh, it provides them with a 60-day grace period following notification, notification by the department in which they can pay uh, the, the overdue tax without being penalized. Representative Frank Ryan has reintroduced a bill to repeal the, the 1099 mis miscellaneous withholding requirement. That's House Bill 34. Uh, it's in the House Finance Committee. Uh, and he's also introduced uh, House Bill 69, uh, which pro provided uh, a per diem type uh, reimbursement system similar to what uh, is currently in federal law uh, for small businesses. Um, House Bill 70, Representative Greg Rothman would reduce the corporate net income tax. Again, um, if you're going to reduce the tax, you have to find a way to pay for it. That's just the only only issue there. Um, that it, any, any type of reduction will have to be part of a broader uh, tax reform discussion. Uh, Senate Bill 180 by Senator Pat Brown conforms the Pennsylvania personal income tax to the federal uh, opportunity zone program, so uh, uh, Pennsylvanians can take advantage of that federal program. And uh, Senate Bills uh, 201, 202, and 203 are part of a, a small business package that have been around for quite some time. Um, you, there you can see like-kind exchanges. Um, there's also, uh, if not, uh, there will be a House companions um, on, those, on those bills as well. Again. Still early in the session, bills are still being introduced, a lot of bills. Uh, this is just a really 
excuse me, a snapshot of what's out there right now, in addition to the, the PICP bills that we're working on. Uh, update on the Department of Revenue real quickly. There's been a lot of um, shuffling of, of, of chairs and what have you. Um, just, so I just wanted to give you a brief update on where, where everything stands. So uh, the musical chairs started when Bob Coyne left. Uh, John Kaschek, who was at the time a Deputy Secretary for Taxation, moved up. And John is now Deputy Secretary of Revenue. When John moved on, he was replaced by uh, Roddy Skipworth um, as Deputy for Taxation. Um, then, shortly thereafter, Sue Layton, who was Deputy Secretary for Compliance and Collections, went back to uh, public accounting, and Roddy um, moved to from Deputy Tech, Deputy for Taxation to Secretary Deputy Secretary for Compliance and Collections, and the new Deputy Secretary for Taxation is Brian Barbin. Uh, Secretary uh, Deputy Secretary Barbin is a former member of the State House. Um, he's a graduate of Pitt and Pitt Law School. Um, he was in a deputy from 1983 to 1989. He was deputy attorney general uh, in the finance uh, and um, tax and finance division. And from 89 to 2008, he was in private practice, mostly here in Harrisburg, I believe. And from 2009 to 2018, he was a member of the Pennsylvania House. So some new faces uh, at the Department of Revenue, new and uh, occupying new chairs. A great team, a great overall team to work with. Real quickly, updates. Um, My Path, uh, which is a new um, online system um, for, for for taxpayers, um, it went live in February, early early this month. It's now live. Um, it, they're now accepting uh, uh, liquid fuels tax uh, payments, um, and also I think by. Uh, later this year, by the fall of 2019, the department hopes to have inheritance tax online through MyPath, and down the road, the PIT, PIT linked 2020. Real quickly, uh, bulletins, uh, just FYI, the most recent issues of bulletins from the department. Most of these were issued the uh, early part of 2019. Um, the, the first one, the corporate tax bulletin, uh, 2019 02. Uh, that is effective for tax years beginning on or after January 1 of, of um, 2018. And, real quick, a plug for the PAC. Um, if you're not a contributor to the PAC, I would uh, obviously encourage you to support it. Um, while we have a team in Harrisburg that does the lobbying um, and is the, the, the uh, the, the, the boots on the ground for the Institute as far as our advocacy. The other component is the political side of it. Um, and, you know, particularly last year in tough election year, uh, the, P, the CPA PAC was very supportive of, of our CPA legislators. So um, if it's, it's, the, it's the only PAC that supports the CPA profession, and we would encourage you to, to support it. Um, one other uh, one other note, um, not on again, not on here, but Day on the Hill, Day on the Hill is scheduled for Tuesday, June 11th, and I think uh, I think that the, we're already accepting registrations for that. So, with that, um, I know we're at our time. I want to uh, again thank you all. Encourage you to follow us on on Twitter, if you will. Um, we provide updates there that uh, probably quicker than than other uh, uh, other avenues. Uh, and questions and answers. If I don't get to your questions, uh, be happy to uh, follow up with you um, uh, directly. Uh, what's the governor doing to reduce the unfunded pension liability? Well, one, um, he's making the annual uh, required contribution, which is, um, I think, pretty significant. Uh, I think had uh, past administrations, both Republican and Democratic, had done that, the, the issue wouldn't be as severe as it is now. The other thing is the General Assembly passed Act 5 of 2017. Um, and I know the, the criticism isn't going to be, well, it, it doesn't do enough. Well, it did as much as, quite frankly, the General Assembly could accomplish with the, with the political dynamics that they had. So um, it does transfer. Uh, it begins a transfer of risk from the Commonwealth to individuals. And um, that is a significant, uh, significant development. And I think... Um, uh, outside organizations, Pew, I think, and some others have, have uh, highlighted it as one of the um, a model uh, law moving forward. 
Um, constitutional issues, uh, adopting combined reporting. Um, possibly, um, but um, unlikely. Possibly, but unlikely. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And what's up with uh, senators retiring? Uh, good question. Um, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. Let's just leave it at that. Um, I think um, I, I know in the case for Don White, um, you know, he's, he's um, been around for a while. And I think that just the timing of it, um, obviously, there's some politics involved um, that we may never know. Um, but their own personal situations. The Russian dollar one, though, that's that's one that was, you know, he he ran for Congress, so that that's not the issue. Alloway, um, you know, he says he's he's tired of the the politics of the of the of, of the job. Um, so, no idea, no idea. Thank you all, and have a great day.